Vecni and Soren both declined to sign Marigold's contract, refusing to bind one of their souls to Trogdors in order to revive him from his eternal slumber. Soren asked Marigold to team up with the Burning Fist once more. She stated she would, but she had a favor to ask. Marigold explained that Vampire Vlad once told her he turned her parents into vampires. Vlad claimed her parents were amongst his minions during the Order of the Burning Fist's battle in the Ferelden throne room. Despite Vlad's words, she did not see her parents amongst Vlad's thralls. Marigold stated she heard a powerful vampire resided in Dova. She asked Soren and Vecni to find this vampire and report his whereabouts to her. In exchange, she would do as Soren asked and join the Order once again. Soren asked if Marigold had any leads as to the location of the vampire or her parents. She instructed Soren to close his eyes and place a hand on his head. Marigold channeled a bit of magic and Soren saw an image of an unfamiliar sigil. The sigil was a strange red symbol on a black background. Soren asked where Marigold found such a sigil and she answered it was found in a book that spoke of a powerful vampire and his friends, influential friends that intended on ruling the world. Vecni asked if Marigold could return the adventurers to the doghouse. She answered she had a strong connection to King Dokken and could return the party to him. Marigold gifted Vecni a Cabbage Patch doll replica of Vecni. She explained Vecni could use the doll to transport herself back to the mansion. All she would have to do is repeat the phrase, Silly Goose Tee Hee, to activate the transportation magic. Marigold continued that once the doll was used, the magic within it would be spent and the power would be gone. She added that any damage the doll received, Vecni would suffer as well. Soren asked Marigold if she could teach him some spells, and convinced her to teach him the Confusion spell, which she copied into his spellbook. The adventurers requested to return to the Cannabis Cafe and Inn. Marigold's eyes went white and purple veins pulsated on her forehead. A powerful wind whipped across the room and blew the young witch's long blonde hair all about. After a brief incantation, the adventurers suddenly found themselves back within the safety of the doghouse. Inside the Cannabis Cafe and Inn, the PCs observed King Doken Swiftwater, Aldrin Brownfinger, Melvin, Pureblood, Pink Mango, and the cloaked man the adventurers first met in Lorgan's Tavern. Moments after the adventurers arrived, a brown-haired dwarf bursted through the front doors of the building with great urgency. The dwarf immediately approached Soren and Vecni, asking them if they had seen Trogdor Dragonbane. He explained he had been sent by Trogdor's father, Cromor, to find his son and return him home to the village of Stoneview. Vecni answered she had never heard of him. Recognizing Trogdor's pale pink axe slung on Vecni's back, the man pressed further. The dwarf told the elvish pirate captain that Cromor believed Trogdor was in great danger and needed help. Vecni stated there was no need to worry as Trogdor was already dead. A solemn Soren drew out the ring he recovered from Trogdor's corpse and presented it to the urgent stranger. The dwarf explained he would return the ring to Cromor and give him the bad news about his son. In the meantime, he offered to assist Vecni and Soren with their travels. Vecni seemed uninterested, asking the stranger if he was any better than the fallen dwarven paladin. This new dwarf continued to say that he trained Trogdor and was considerably stronger. He added he was the guard and protector of the Dragonbane family. Soren commended Trogdor's bravery, but added he was very foolish, running face first into battle, smiting everything. Both Vecni and Soren agreed with one another that Trogdor blew his load very quickly, which left Vecni embarrassed for him. The stranger agreed with the two adventurers, commenting that Trogdor was young and got a little excited at times. Vecni asked the stranger's name, and he answered it was Beric Harag. Vecni asked Beric to join she and Soren on their adventure after sharing a drink. Beric readily agreed. The adventurer spoke with the bartender, Autumn, for a time. Autumn was very interested in the group's trials and tribulations after seeing the two enter King Dokken's portal, but Vecni was dismissive when telling the tale, acting like it was no big deal. Autumn had news about Vigor Valley City since Soren and Vecni had left. She spoke on undead creatures attacking the city, killing many. Autumn stated there were reports that the Armorer, Armorer's Apprentice, and Armorer's Slave were all slain by the monsters. She continued there was an undead woman with long black hair that she used to wrap around, attack, and choke people. 
Autumn explained the creature disappeared into the residential district and attacked the peasants living there each night. Autumn added Mayor Shroud was missing and an election for a new mayor would be held on Ill Matter 22nd, which was only five days away. The two individuals running for mayor were Salvatore, the tiefling Forte Assassination Squad member that Vecni and Sorn avoided fighting, and Sir Galloway, the former Blood Mist member who captured Lord Henry and his men prior to the adventurers arriving in Vicar Valley City. Autumn spoke on the Medicine Man's desire for peace and his concern about war between Slay and Chaos, who do not like one another. Autumn remarked it was strange Queen Inez had Drow soldiers under her banner, since Drow were not native to Dova. Vecni considered maybe Dova wasn't as bad as she thought. Vecni asked about Prince, and Autumn explained that he was at the doghouse before the party arrived. She continued that the pirate crew, the misfit bastards, were also there at this time. And while she did not find their leader, Radalak, to be a nice person, the pirate called Prince attacked him for no reason at all and was captured. Autumn reiterated the doghouse was a place of peace and the medicine man did not approve of violence within the settlement. Supposedly, the misfit bastards were heading towards Cutthroat Stocks, which was quite far away. Soren, Vecni, and Barak approached King Dokin, Oldrum, and Melvin in the bar area. Soren asked the king to sign Lord Winnegar's ally ledger, which he did without reading it or asking what it was. Gragas hobbled over to the group and asked Vecni if she asked Marigold about him. Vecni said Marigold did not remember him and the saddened dwarf hobbled away. Vecni and Dokin spoke a bit about Prince, Captain Mundo, Radalak, and the mutiny aboard the Bastard Sire. Dokin admitted he had Sir Duncan orchestrate the mutiny because Mundo was not doing as the king asked. He added that it was not a big deal, just business. Vecni disagreed, saying it was a big deal to those involved. Dokin gloated that under Radalak's leadership, the Misfit Bastards did as he asked, as long as he rewarded them. Dokin stated Radalak claimed the Misfit Bastards sunk the Moonronian Armada on the Calbraid Sea, south of Dova. Vecni was angered at this, explaining it was the Golden Tusk pirate fleet that defeated the Moonronians. She added the Misfit Bastards no longer even had a ship. Dokin remarked that made sense, and he thought Radalak had more officers than those that visited the doghouse. Vecni told Dokin she and Prince killed five Misfit Bastards officers during their journey to Dova. Vecni and Sorn introduced King Dokin to Beric. Beric explained he was searching for the son of one of his friends, but learned he died, so now he has free time on his hands. Vecni asked the half-elf king to join them on their adventure, but he mostly ignored her question and bragged how he saved the entire continent of Thadius the last time he embarked on an adventure. Soren, Vecni, and Barak visited Norsk Berserker at the deluxe shop in Smithy to do some shopping. Soren bought a wand containing finite charges of a modified Summon Lesser Demon spell for 2,520 gold. Norsk was excited to see Vecni again. He spoke with her about his business and how he kept lowering his prices but was making very few sales. Vecni haggled with Norsk over purchasing a plus one short bow and selling the pale pink axe Trogdor wielded in battle, as well as a longsword. Soren haggled with Norsk, trying to sell a suit of chainmail as well as a chain shirt. The pair sold all four items for a store credit of 2,000 gold, which Soren immediately spent to purchase a plus two non-magical shield for Beric after a brief argument with Vecni, which costed a total of 6,170 gold. The shield was made of steel and painted with a faded clad sigil. Using a lit torch and his dagger, Soren scraped the paint off Barak's new shield. Then, with his ink pen, Soren drew the sigil of Ferelden on the inside of the shield. He also wrote a brief message on the studded leather shield strap, which read, Remember who gave this to you. Once Soren completed his work, he handed the small, round steel shield to his new companion. Vecni purchased Oil of Greater Magic Weapon plus one for 750 gold. Vecni asked Norsk if he was free for dinner later that night. Norsk answered he already had dinner plans with his strange friend Fenris, but Vecni was welcome to join them. Vecni asked if she could bring Soren and Beric as well. Norsk agreed to cook for everyone, while Vecni would supply algae brew beer for the dinner. And thus, a dinner party was planned for later in the evening. Vecni asked Norsk if he could identify the properties of a witch's broom she procured from Marigold's mansion. Norsk said he didn't believe the item was magical after he examined it briefly. Vecni tried to get a price on Nicholas's scimitar, but after poking and prodding at it, Norsk declined to give one. He said that the weapon had an ominous nature and he did not want it in his shop. As a free gift for spending so much coin at this establishment, Norse gave Vecni a metal box, which she used to protect the Cabbage Patch doll replica of herself she received from Marigold. Vecni gave Norsk a kiss on the cheek before leaving the shop, which left him blushing. 
Immediately after leaving the deluxe shop in Smithy, Vecni and Soren plotted on how to get Norse drunk during the dinner party so they could burglarize his store. After re-entering the Cannabis Cafe and Inn, Soren and Vecni observed Pink Mango sitting on King Doken Swiftwater's lap. Vecni questioned Soren about the situation, but Soren insisted he believed the king's words and that nothing fishy was going on between he and Pinky. Soren and Vecni spoke with Pureblood for a while, trying to kill some time. During their conversation, Soren drew a quick sketch of the mysterious sigil he saw in Marigold's mansion and showed it to the Orc of Dogs, asking if he knew of it. In his peripheral vision, Soren noticed the cloaked man he had never spoke to sitting alone at a table across the bar and looking directly at him. The scrawny, balding man was staring intently at the young wizard and his drawing. The man was taking deep breaths, his eyes were open wide, and he looked nervous. Soren looked over to the man, who noticed Soren noticing him, so he quickly looked away and averted his gaze. Soren approached the man and slammed his sketch down on the table. Then he took a seat and grabbed a handful of bar nuts. The man slid the bowl of bar nuts over the paper with great urgency. Then, he flung the ball and paper underneath onto the floor. The man apologized and quickly dived down, picking spilled nuts up and placing them back into the bowl. The man returned to his seat and set the bowl back down on the table, but Soren's sketch of the strange sigil was gone. The man whispered to Soren, saying he should not bust that sigil out for everyone to see. He needs to be cool and discreet about it. Soren asked what it was, and the man responded by asking for a fresh sheet of paper. The cloak man took the paper and began to write. The man's hand shook, and he was sweating profusely while putting his message to paper. He quickly passed the paper to Soren and urgently whispered Soren should put it in his pocket and look at it later. Soren swiftly and nonchalantly slipped the message into his robes. The man told Soren he did not wish to be seen with him and would be leaving. He added if Soren wanted to speak further, he would be at Norsk's house later in the evening for dinner. Then the man left. Soren realized the mysterious man must be Fenris, the weird friend Norsk mentioned to Vecni. Beric approached Soren and observed copious amounts of sweat on the table. He asked what this was all about. Soren said he wasn't sure, then drew out Fenris's message. The message mentioned something called the Order and said they had been searching for the medicine man for a long time. The letter asked Soren to give the Order the location of the doghouse. Soren vaguely recalled two men he met at Lorgan's Tavern, Morio and Vittori, who were connected to this group. Vecni and Soren took a long rest. While Beric visited the medicine man in his quarters, the two shared a drink and some sticky icky, while Beric asked the medicine man about himself. M.M. told Beric he trained in martial arts as a young man and was a part of a group of dangerous dudes. Beric asked M.M. to elaborate, but he declined, stating the knowledge could put Beric in danger. Beric began to feel overwhelmed by the effects of the cannabis. The Ironbridge Dwarf asked M.M. if there was anything he could teach him. M.M. explained he could teach Beric how to hit harder, last longer in a fight, or use magic. Beric said he wanted to learn how to hit harder. M.M. said Slay and Chaos were on the brink of war. He continued, if Beric could bring peace between the two factions, the Medicine Man would teach him how to hit harder. Then, M.M. gave Beric a kiss on the forehead. Beric left the Medicine Man's quarters and returned to the Cannabis Cafe and Inn to drink at the bar and wait for his new allies to wake up. Hours later, Vecni awoke from her long rest. Her dinner party with Norsk and Fenris was scheduled at 7, so she had little time if she was to enjoy another meal in Norsk's home. She attempted to shake Soren awake, but he was sound asleep. Vecni went down to the bar and grabbed Beric, who had been smoking and drinking at the bar for hours. On the way over to Norsk's home, Vecni pulled on the door handle to the deluxe shop in Smithy, finding it locked. She looked around and observed there were few people around. During her time at the doghouse, she noticed the settlement had no sentries standing guard, and she estimated the total population to be approximately 100 people. Vecni and Beric arrived at Norsk's house for the dinner party, and a nicely and seductively dressed Norsk berserker answered the front door. Inside, Beric and Vecni became acquainted with Fenris, Norsk's other guest. After introductions, Vecni went to help Norsk in the kitchen, while Beric spoke further with Fenris. Beric asked Fenris, who was stuttering, sweating, and extremely nervous about the Order. Upon realizing Beric didn't truly have knowledge about the Order, but was aware something was going on and that the secret group existed, Fenris slowly drew out a dagger from one of the sleeves of his cloak. Beric explained how Marigold Mandrake showed Soren and Vecni the symbol in her mansion. Fenris put his dagger away, but explained the Order of Dominance would have him killed if he shared information about them. 
He said he wished to return to the Order to tell them of Zimler's whereabouts, but he was stuck at the doghouse, as he would be unable to survive a trek through Opona's bog. Fenris added, Zimler was the actual name of the Medicine Man, and he left the Order of Dominance. The, 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 there is no l leaving the o Order, Fenris ominously whispered. The Order wanted Zimler's location so they could execute him for leaving them. Fenris tasked Beric with providing Zimler's location to the Order. Beric asked what he would receive in exchange for his help. Fenris explained service to the Order was service for life. Working for the Order would give purpose and influence over the world. Fenris described the Order of Dominance as an Illuminati-type group with influence over all world governments, big businesses, and organized religions. Fenris brought the dagger out again and menacingly whispered, S -s -s So, what's you your a answer? Beric accepted the mission. Fenris explained to forward the message Beric must find another agent or an actual council member and relay the information. He said one of the council members could be found in the town of Nightfall, and another could be found at the Order of the Consecrated Righteous Paladin Temple. Fenris stated there were 13 council members in total. Vecni finished assisting Norsk and came to sit with Beric and Fenris. She asked Fenris if he was a vampire, but he stated he was not. Vecni explained she learned someone from the Order of Dominance was a vampire. Fenris stated one of the 13 council members, the second, was a vampire. A stuttering Venris added this vampire was dangerous and could be found at the town of Nightfall. Vecni asked the vampire's name, but Fenris answered, well, We t -t do not s speak their names. Names have p power. Further conversation with Fenris revealed the Medicine Man was once one of the 13. Since then, another had taken his place. Number 13, the Skin Changer, a being that can take the shape of others. Fenris added it was possible the adventurers had met him already. Attendees of the dinner party enjoyed the meal Norse prepared. Beric ate sadly, reflecting on the news of Trogdor's demise. Throughout the meal, Vecni continuously plied Norse with glasses of beer, getting him quite drunk. Around the time everyone finished eating and Norse began to clean up, Soren arrived at the modest home, freshly rested. Beric filled Soren in on his conversation with Fenris. Beric and Soren questioned Fenris on the identities of the other 13 Order of Dominance council members. A stuttering Fenris described the members he was aware of. A swordsman, a vampire, a scholar, a warlock, the flame, the totem, the commander, the master, the summoner, the paladin, the parasite, the skin changer, and the generator. Vecni overheard the conversation and made the connection that the master was the same man Mario said he served. Fenris explained, generally speaking, the lower the number, the stronger the order member, meaning the first is much more powerful than the last. Fenris stated the swordsman is the strongest and first of the council, the vampire is second, the scholar is third, the warlock is fourth, the master is fifth, the flame is sixth, the parasite is tenth, and the skin changer is the thirteenth, but he did not know the other seat's numbers. He said he knew the swordsman's name, but he could not tell Soren, Vecni, and Barak as the names of the Order members had power, and he would be punished for disclosing the swordsman's name. Vecni used her amulet of thoughts to read Fenris's mind. She learned, the swordsman's name was Sparatolo, the commander's name was Vaz Vagat, the paladin's name was Vontaine, the parasite's name was Bracken, and the generator's name was Manus Rayon. Fenris fearfully begged Vecni to stop learning the names, as the duration of the amulet's ability expired. Vecni asked the Order's stance on vigor, and a stammering Fenris stated, v -v -v vigor must fall. Vecni asked the Order's stance on Prince Lorien's claim to the throne. Fenris answered the Order did not care about Lorien or Dova. He continued, it was only the Fury Lord Maki the Order was concerned with. Fenris explained, Maki was formerly one of the Order's council members, but like Zimler, the Medicine Man, Maki abandoned the Order and they both must die. Vecni asked if there was a reward for turning in Zimler, and Fenris answered, Yes, you will get to be a part of those that control the entire world. Soren reflected on Fenris's words, thinking perhaps his mother needed the Burning Fist back together in order to defeat the Thirteen. He wondered if the Order of Dominance served the mysterious being called Blank. Soren asked Fenris if the Order served Blank, but he stated he did not know who or what Blank was. Beric casted Zone of Truth in the midst of the dinner party, forcing Fenris to be truthful in any answers. But still, he insisted he did not know Blank. 
Vecni asked if the Order cared about Queen's Grace and Slay, which she answered no. She asked if any of the council members sat on a throne. Fenris hesitated a moment and answered, Yes. Fenris said he received his mission to find Zimler from Murio approximately six months ago, but when he saw him at Lorgan's Tavern, the two men acted like strangers. Vecni, Soren, and Barak agreed to serve as agents of the Order as long as their gold was good. Barak asked Fenris how best to reach the vampire in Nightfall, which was the closest Order member. Fenris explained, Vigor destroyed the bridge north of Pridecutter Keep, so the adventurers would need to go underneath through a labyrinth. A nervous, stuttering Fenris vacated Norsk's home, quickly distancing himself from the adventurers who had just finished interrogating him. Vecni continued to ply Norsk Berserker with glass after glass of algae brew beer, intent on getting him drunk so she could swipe the keys to his shop. As the night progressed, Norsk quickly became deep in his cups. While sitting at the table, Norsk placed his hand on top of Vecni's, which the elven pirate permitted. He began to gently caress the top of her hand with his middle finger, and Vecni nonchalantly moved her hand away to grab her drink. Vecni whispered to Soren, asking him to keep Norsk distracted for a bit. Then she entered the kitchen to search for the key to the deluxe shop in Smithy. Vecni searched the cupboards and drawers, but could not find what she was looking for. Vecni returned to the intoxicated Norsk and offered to put him to bed. He made a drunken pass at her, but she declined, stating she was not that kind of girl. Vecni escorted Norsk into his room, where he lost his balance and collapsed onto the bed. He padded the sheets next to him and motioned for Vecni to join him. Meanwhile, Soren searched the living room and found a healing potion in a chest hidden under some clothes. Vecni sat on the bed with Norsk in a reserved manner. He told her not to be shy and reached for her leg, but she smoothly moved her leg out of his reach. Norsk asked Vecni how many dates it would take her before she got intimate with a man, and she answered, around five. Norsk told her he respected that and couldn't wait to have another date with her. He added he would have a gift waiting for her the next time she returned to the doghouse. Vecni gave Norsk a gentle kiss on his forehead. He reached into a drawer near his bed and pulled out a dusty brass ring. Norsk presented the ring to Vecni, which belonged to his grandmother and was a promise ring. He placed the ring on Vecni's ring finger. After explaining acceptance of the ring meant she could not give herself to another man. Norsk gave Vecni a hug and then she left his bedroom. In the back of her mind, Vecni still yearned for the washboard abs and Adonis-like physique of Mickley and Greystone. She was only using this man, Norsk, to gain access to the powerful items in his shop. Vecni, Soren, and Barak exited Norsk's home and noticed the doghouse was pretty quiet, with few people out and about. Town, but not much else. Soren casted invisibility on Vecni so she could burglarize Norsk's shop. Barak and Soren returned to the Cannabis Cafe and Inn, where only Autumn and Pink Mango were present. Pink Mango was dancing by herself while puffing on a pipe. The demure, dark-skinned beauty approached Barak and appeared quite under the influence of the sticky icky, commonly found in the doghouse. She tried to flirt with Barak, but he did not humor her. Pinky sat down at the booth with Barak and Soren, scooting her curvy booty extremely close to the battle-hardened dwarven paladin from Ironbridge. Pinky and Barak got to know one another. She asked Barak if he would swear his sword to the dogs, but the dwarf declined, stating he fights for the Ironbridge kingdom and people in need. Meanwhile, an invisible Vecni found all windows and the only door to the deluxe shop in Smithy to be locked. Above the door handle, Vecni observed art of a smiling dog with green vegetation in its mouth, etched into the wood of the door. The invisible pirate used one of her darts to pick the lock and open the door just a bit, then slipped into Norsk's shop. Vecni ransacked the struggling business, stealing the Manual of Quickness of Action, a scroll of Cure Wounds, a scroll of Heat Metal, and Trogdor's Pink Axe. After her burglary was completed, Vecni exited the shop, quietly closed the door, and returned to her companions, completely unnoticed. The invisible Vecni quietly whispered to Soren that the task was done. The three adventurers returned upstairs to their room, and Soren dropped the invisibility spell. A triumphant Vecni gleefully announced to Soren, I got you a present. She gifted Soren the Scroll of Cure Light Wounds and the Scroll of Heat Metal. Then, Vecni presented the fallen Trogdor's pale pink axe to Barak. She tossed it to him, but the dwarven paladin failed to catch the weapon. Trogdor's axe clattered to the ground, and Barak quickly and nonchalantly picked it up.
Sora ritual cast to identify on the brass ring Vecni received from Norsk, determining it was not magical. The adventurers left the doghouse, emerging back into a bonus bog. Sora cast a mage armor on himself to prepare for the dangers he knew laid before him. Before venturing deeper into the bog, the adventurers decided they should ask the medicine man for directions to the lizard folk of Frank as they wished to meet with their leader, Snorian. Back inside the doghouse, the party knocked on MM's front door, but it was well past midnight and the leader of dogs did not answer. The adventurers observed the man wearing a white suit and white fedora was still in the center of town, so they approached him instead of waking the medicine man. The man, Service, who was sporting sparse hair on his cheeks and neck that looked like pubic hairs, greeted the party with a cheer and beer. Vecni followed up with a smoke and joke. Vecni asked Serve where she could find the lizard men, Frank. He explained if the adventurers traveled north through Opona's Bog and ascended Comet Mountain, they would reach Chieftain Snorian and his people at the summit. Service added the trek to the Lizard Folk Village would be dangerous. Vegni asked the man if there was an easier way to reach those of Frank. Service suggested speaking with the dwarves of Ironbridge Kingdom, as the border of their lands was close to Comet Mountain. Soren got confused about the name of the faction, Frank. Vegni explained Frank's leader was not named Frank, but was Snorian, Lady Epona's husband. She added Soren must have been confusing the faction's name with the name of the Forte leader, Frank Mandred. Serve warned Soren not to bring up Frank Mandred's name whilst in Snorian's village of Afry. The adventurers left the doghouse again, and Soren summoned Dexter, his owl familiar, for scouting purposes. Beric led the group as they left the landing area that led to the doghouse and crossed the small pond right outside. The party came to a fork and decided to follow the path leftwards, still moving north along a flooded section of the swamp with few areas a person could stand. Vecna used her shape water spell to create a 5x15 ice raft. The adventurers boarded Captain Vecna's vessel and began to traverse the watery path. Soren sent Dexter out to scout, observing crocodiles, giant crocodiles, and three closed chests. Using a fallen branch, Beric steered the ice raft like a gondola. After traveling a short distance, the party observed ten crocodiles ahead of them, calmly hanging around in the water. Vecni drew out and unfurled her whip, preparing for a potential confrontation with the wild beasts. Beric guided the ice raft past the crocodiles, who begrudgingly moved out of the way. As the party passed by, the crocodiles eyed them, extremely interested in the group of PCs. Vecni lit a stick of dynamite and hurled it into the water, intentionally avoiding harming any of the animals. A small explosion erupted on the surface of the water. The crocodiles gave the adventurers more space. Some submerged under the water, while others simply increased their distance from the ice raft. Further north, two giant crocodiles were startled after noticing the explosion, and they looked south towards the adventurers. Through Dexter's eyes, Soren scanned the tree line above, looking for a bird. He observed a colorful bird perched high on a tree branch. Soren casted Mind Sliver on the animal, destroying its brain with his psychic power. The small bird fell from the tree branch into the water below. Still cautious from the detonated dynamite, one of the giant crocodiles slowly swam over to the floating deceased bird and ate it with a single bite. Beric propelled the group forward, eventually turning to the right a bit and disembarking on solid ground. Vecni stepped onto a small piece of land where a massive treasure chest was located while Soren and Beric stayed on the ice raft. Soren casted Molt Earth to make the ground solid, fearing he and his allies could sink into the muck. Vecni got the feeling something was watching her. She did not see anything, but detected a threat and knew she was in danger. Not only that, but the hairs on Vecni's neck were standing up, and she knew this threat was extremely close. Vecni whispered her concerns to Soren, who commanded Dexter to do a quick pass, searching for threats. Dexter was unable to detect any hostiles near the group. Vecni recognized a sound nearby, which sounded quite familiar to the sounds made by the spider she battled previously in the bog. Soren casted dancing lights to illuminate the area. He listened closely and determined that there were three separate large creatures in his immediate vicinity on the small piece of land where he and his allies stood. Soren casted Minor Illusion and conjured the image of a giant fly approximately 10 feet away from his group. He 
he heard the strange sounds moving further away from him towards his conjuration. A minute went by and Soren's magic expired, ending the giant fly image. Vepni carefully approached the chest and opened it. As she undid the latch and lifted the lid, she saw a flash of bright light. When the light faded away, Vecni observed the following inside the chest. A saddle, a stone token with golden art of a feather on it, and a small statue. Vecni retrieved the statue and the coin from the chest. Suddenly, three large spiders appeared out of nowhere. The spiders looked different from the ones Vecni and Soren faced previously, as these were distinctly white and blue in color. These spiders did not simply sneak up on the heroes, but blinked suddenly into existence. One moment they were not there, and the next moment they were in the midst of the adventurers and poised to attack. Soren realized the appearance of these creatures was very similar to when Odoacer's steed, Apocalypse, suddenly manifested. One of the strange creatures attempted to bite Soren on the ice raft, but the beast missed. The other two spiders had Vecni flanked and attempted to pincer her. One of them bit down hard on Vecni's left hip, injecting venom into the High Elf Pirate. Soren cast a hypnotic pattern on the battlefield, affecting Vecni and all three spiders. Vecni resisted the effects of the spell, as did the spiders. At first, but Soren casted silvery barbs, which forced the spiders to succumb to the spell and become incapacitated. Beric pushed an incapacitated spider off of the ice boat. Vecni scooped the saddle up out of the chest and ran back to the ice boat, jumping aboard. Soren commanded Dexter to go on ahead in order to scout out the next chest. Beric used his tree branch to steer the ice raft further north, away from the strange spiders and towards the next treasure chest. Keep in mind, those spiders were still stunned by Soren's hypnotic pattern for the time being. The group made it to the next section of solid ground. Vecni and Beric disembarked the ice raft with another treasure chest before them. This chest was very inortly decorated with gemstones and a fancy design. Vecni detected a slight humming sound coming from the chest and a subtle glowing pink aura surrounding it. Vecni called over to Soren, asking him to identify the strange chest, but he gave a long-winded explanation, detailing the reasons he could not do that at this time. Examining it briefly, Soren felt this chest was similar to the urn he and Vecni found in the cave near Vigor Valley City. Soren readied to spell magic, planning to cast it if any harm came to Vecni upon the elven pirate entering the vicinity of the chest's pink aura. Beric readied his axe, planning to attack any hostiles that emerged from the chest. Vecni attempted to open the chest and found it to be locked. She picked the lock with a dart and opened the chest. Inside, a pink light got brighter and brighter and brighter. Soren believed something inside was about to explode, so he casted his ready to spell magic spell on the chest. The light became dim and then dissipated completely. Inside the chest, Vecni retrieved a pair of slippers. The soles of the slippers were purple, with the top portions of the slippers pale pink in color. In an effort to mine the gemstones adorned on the fancy chest, Beric reeled back his pink axe and brought it down hard. His axe blade clanged off the lid, leaving the chest completely undamaged. Beric completely failed at extracting the gemstones. The adventurers returned to the ice raft, and Beric guided them north towards the third and final chest. As the party neared it, they realized this path came to a dead end. The party discussed clearing the area of the two giant crocodiles in their vicinity, as they feared facing the blue and white spiders and giant crocodiles simultaneously. The group decided it would be best to slay the crocodiles while the spiders were still under the effect of Soren's hypnotic pattern, which had not yet expired. Beric steered the ice raft over to one of the crocs. He charged thunder magic into his pink axe and raised the weapon overhead. He swung twice at one of his reptilian threats, landing the second blow. Beric's axe blade collided hard with the crocodile's head, and he unleashed a thunderous smite on the creature. Thunder magic 
coursed through the giant animal, reverberating through its body and causing an incredibly loud, crackling sound to echo throughout the bog. The sound vibration from Beric's attack pushed water on the surface surrounding the croc in all directions. Trees rattled, birds and insects scattered, and every living creature in the swamp became alert to the thunderous sound. The ten normal-sized crocodiles south from the adventurers reacted fearfully in response to Beric's magic. Some submerged themselves underneath the murky water, while others moved further away to get some more distance from the sound. Vecni lashed the giant crocodile twice with her whip, stunning it with a stunning strike on her first attack. Then she followed up, kicking the beast on the snout. Soren casted Fireball and positioned the spell so it would only hit the two crocodiles, badly damaging them with fire magic. Trees nearby caught on fire as well. The crocodile that was not stunned walked a short distance to the edge of the water and plunged in, submerging itself into the murky liquid. The adventurers could no longer see the beast. Beric lifted his pale pink axe high over the stunned giant crocodile. Then he yelled out, Huzzah! And cleanly cleaved the enormous beast's head off, spilling cold reptilian blood into the muck. Vecni leapt ten feet from the ice raft onto another section of dry land. There was a plain wooden chest with a rusted padlock before her. Vecni delivered a savage sidekick to the rusty lock, snapping off the latch of the chest. The chest popped open, revealing three healing potions, which Vecni took with no hesitation. Vecni ran back to the water's edge and leapt another ten feet back onto the ice boat with her treasure. Vecni whispered to Beric, Get us out of here! The giant crocodile emerged from the murky waters of the Pona's bog on the side of the ice raft. The creature snapped at Beric with his giant jaws, but missed. The beast turned and submerged itself again, and as it did so, swung its tail at the dwarven paladin from Ironbridge. Soren casted its silvery barbs to protect Beric from the attack, but the giant creature's tail still whacked Beric hard in the face as he simultaneously lashed out at the reptile with his axe, slashing deep into his back. The dwarf wobbled on the narrow ice raft, then dropped his body weight and resisted being knocked off the boat into the dark cold water below. Soren realized it had been 36 seconds since his one minute long hypnotic pattern spell incapacitated the giant blue and white spiders. He knew it was imperative that the group did not linger much longer in this area, otherwise the creatures might renew their attack. Beric frantically paddled steering the ice boat south with his tree branch, trying to put some distance between his party and the giant crocodile. The group reached the area populated with the regular-sized crocs, which eyed the adventurers, but not attack, as the three warriors reached them. The elven pirate readied her whip, intending to lash out at the giant crocodile if it attacked again. As the party traveled quickly, choosing to move in a straight path, avoiding looking back towards the direction of the giant crocodile and the giant spiders. The dwarf guided their ice rafts further south, arriving at the start of the body of water. The adventurers double-timed it to the doghouse, planning to rest, as well as divvy up and identify their new loot. Inside the doghouse, Soren ritual cast identify on the pink slippers, while Vecni began to read her manual of quickness. Of action. The wizard learned the pink slippers, like Trogdor's pink axe, grew in power with the user as long as the user kept the item attuned. The current strength of the slippers would grant the user plus 10 to movement speed, and all the user's attacks would become magical. These slippers were quite special, and it would take seven days to attune to them. Soren Ritual casted Identify on the saddle, learning it was. Saddle of the Cavalier, a magic saddle that increased a rider's defenses while riding a mount. Still using Identify, Soren cast it on a small rose-colored statue, learning it was the Ayun Stone of Protection. Once attuned to this stone, 
would orbit around the user's head, granting plus one AC. Enemies could target the stone to catch or destroy it. Sora Ritual casts an Identify on the stone coin with golden art of a feather on it, learning it was Qual's feather token. This item could summon a rock-like bird capable of carrying 500 pounds and flying 144 miles in a single day. The item's ability would expire after a single day, and the item was single use. After a brief discussion what to do with the items, Barak took possession of the Saddle of the Cavalier and the Pink Slippers. Fekni took the Qual Feather token, and Soren took the Ayun Stone of Protection. The party long rested after their brief foray into the opponent's bog, so they would be fresh and ready for the dangers yet to come. The adventurers awoke in their room within the Cannabis Cafe and Inn. Malakos was in the room with them as well, having found his way to Vecni and her allies once again. Soren rose from his rest, feeling more powerful and intelligent than he was before. Vecni, who woke up before the others, read her manual of quickness of action for a bit. Malakos and Barak became acquainted, as this was their first time meeting one another. Malakos first thought Barak was the deceased dwarf, Trogdor Dragonbane, as he thought all dwarves looked alike and could not tell the difference between the two at first. Vecni, hoping to avoid Norse Berserker, the shopkeeper she stole from, urged the rest of the party to return to the bog. Vecni, Soren, Barak, and Malakos exited the doghouse and pushed northwards into unexplored sections of the swamp with Barak leading the group. Dexter scouted an area where Soren previously observed gray-skinned humanoid creatures, giant snakes, giant toads, giant crocodiles, and swarms of insects through his familiar's eyes. Those creatures were not present at this time, but there were humanoid corpses laying in the area instead, slowly sinking into the muck. The corpses wore forte colors, and there were forte banners laid down near the dead men. As the group got closer to the corpses, Barak observed deceased lizard folk amongst the dead forte soldiers as well. These lizard folk donned red and yellow clothing and armor, as well as the Frank sigil, a red lizard claw printed on a yellow background. Two gray-skinned humanoid creatures with iguana-like heads, long-fingered clawed hands, sharp teeth, and tails were hunched over the corpses. The beasts were feeding on the dead, gnawing on bone and munching on flesh. The adventurers discussed what to do. Vecni considered climbing a tree and traversing through the dense treetops, while Beric suggested hugging the thick brush and sneaking past the beasts. Vecni crept closer to the creatures and climbed a tree, taking cover behind it. She drew out her bow and notched her arrow. Looking over to the others for approval, Soren gave the elven pirate a nod. Vecni drew back on her bowstring and whispered to her old crewmate, Malakos, ready your bow! Malakos quickly climbed the tree, then immediately drew out his bow, notched an arrow, and drew back on the string. Both adventurers made hidden ranged attacks from behind the tree. Malakos launched a sneak attack arrow at one of the gray creatures, while Vecni fired a quick two-arrow barrage of her own, leading with a Kensai shot. The three arrows punctured through the beast's back, one after another after another, in rapid succession. The creature fell dead, face first, into the group of deceased soldiers. Vecni fired an arrow at the second gray-skinned creature. The arrow had pierced into the beast's chest, plunging into its heart, and the monster toppled over dead. Malakos casted mage armor on himself immediately after his foe dropped into the muck, realizing he should have casted it before he engaged in battle. Soren searched the Forte corpses and found a healing potion on one of the deceased. Vecni examined them and determined these Forte soldiers were not a part of Harshal's group, the man who they met in the bog shortly after she and Soren first arrived, seven days prior. Vecni recovered a short sword from the corpse of a deceased Frank Lizardman. While she and her allies looted the dead, Vecni detected eight more of the gray-skinned creatures stalking her group, hidden in brush and behind trees. She also realized there were thick swarms of flies in the brush as well, staying hidden from the adventurers. Vecni alerted her allies to the danger all around them. The group briefly discussed their options, luring the beasts out to slay them or attempting to escape. 
Vecni kept a close eye on the creatures, who sank back into the shadows. Soren realized the beasts were intimidated by his group after witnessing their strength and were not a threat. Vecni misliked this, as the creatures would likely trail behind her party as the adventurers continued north, but Malakos and Soren were not worried, considering the beasts too weak to be of concern. With Vecni on point, the adventurers pushed north, then west through an opening in the trees. They entered an area with another small pond, which would require some swimming to cross. Vecni observed the following in the pond. Two crocodiles in the water, fairly close to their position. A small landing past the crocs, another crocodile past the landing, then another landing, this one much larger. Upon the last landing was a group of soldiers wearing forte colors. Some of the men held banners bearing the forte sigil. The soldiers had their backs to their adventurers, focused on a large cage behind them. The cage contained two lizardfolk prisoners. Vecni noticed a man poking and prodding the lizardfolk through their cage. At first, he thought it was Karaganda, but Vecni quickly realized this man was much larger than the Forte leader. This man wore a heavy red hauberk and looked familiar to Vecni and Soren. Vecni recalled seeing him near the mayor's office when Honesty played a song near the gallows, outing she and Soren in Vigor Valley City just prior to Soren meeting Odoacer. In front of the city hall, the party observed rows and rows of Forte soldiers. The rows appeared to be assembled behind three separate, distinct leaders. An armored man wearing Forte colors. He had uncombed, poofy orange hair and a patchy, greasy looking orange beard. He was missing one of his front teeth. There was an enormous man in a heavy red hauberk. And there was the tiefling assassin, Salvatore, that the group met in the Vigor Valley city sewers. There were three separate legions of soldiers outside the mayor's office, each led by a different Forte leader, which consisted of Salvatore, Harshal, and this third unknown warrior. Vecni and Soren briefly discussed how to proceed. Vecni stated she didn't particularly want to speak with these men. Soren nonchalantly quipped he could easily murder the entire legion of soldiers. Malakos excitedly whispered, Fireball. Soren answered, No, not Fireball, something much stronger. Fireball is broken enough. What could be stronger than that? Vecni asked. Soren shook his head and smiled, preparing his new spell. Vecni drew out her bow, notched an arrow, and aimed at the large man with the heavy red hauberk. Meanwhile, Malkos hid in some nearby brush, planning to attack anyone who showed hostility towards his allies. Soren casted sickening radiance over the pond. Dim, greenish light descended upon the battlefield, covering two of the crocodiles and every Forte soldier. The spell's effect did not reach the two imprisoned lizard folk or any of the adventurers, however. The large man with the heavy red hauberk began to feel the effects of Soren's spell, but he willed himself to resist the ability. The man plunged into the water and began to make his way towards the adventurers, stopping before the set of two crocodiles. Vecni fired an arrow at her heavily armored foe, but the arrowhead bounced off his armor, leaving him completely unharmed. Beric readied his axe, planning to swing it at his armored opponent if the man came within range of the dwarven paladin from Ironbridge. The greenish light washed dimly over the ten forte soldiers near the caged lizard folk. Eight of the soldiers suffered considerable radiant damage and became exhausted from the effects of the spell. The remaining two warriors resisted Soren's magic. The ten soldiers entered the pond and began to make their way towards their attackers. Due to the exhaustion, eight of the men had disadvantage while trying to swim through the area. Eight of the Forte soldiers failed to effectively swim through the pond towards their prey, and they began to sink. The remaining two men swam towards Soren, Vecni, Barak, and Malakos. The soldier in front delivered a combination attack on a crocodile that stood in his way. His blade danced in the air and sliced through the creature twice, killing it. Malakos fired an arrow at the soldier that killed the crocodile. The arrowhead sank into the man's ribs, activating sneak attack and dealing considerable damage. Malakos grabbed one of Vecni's breasts to give her encouragement, then hid in a bush again. Vecni entered the pond and used Step of the Wind to move quickly through the water. 
She drew out Ignis and hurled it at a Forte soldier towards the back. Her magic javelin soared towards her target, leaving a trail of lightning magic behind, damaging a crocodile and several Forte soldiers. Ignis slammed into the man-at-arms Vecni aimed at, dealing tremendous damage. The soldier's knees wobbled, but he retained his composure and still stood, able to fight. Man, that guy's tough, Vecni thought to herself. Soren used his telekinesis to push the heavily armed man backwards five feet. Then, the young wizard casted Tasha's Mind Whip on the large warrior. The spell appeared extra effective against the heavily armored Forte member, and Soren's magic lessened the man's competence in battle for a brief time. Soren's sickening radiance continued to wash over the man with the heavy red halberd. The man continued to resist the effects of Soren's radiant magic, but Soren casted silvery barbs, which forced his foe to take radiant damage from the spell and become exhausted. Soren observed the radiant damage appeared extra effective against this opponent. The heavy armored warrior moved through the water and pushed through the outer limits of Soren's spell, escaping the dim green radiant light. Beric flung himself into the pond. Even with his heavy chainmail, he swam out near Vecni and lifted his axe. Beric readied his weapon, intending on striking out at any hostiles that approached his elven pirate companion. Radiant magic burned through the skin and internal organs of one of the Forte soldiers. The man screamed in excruciating pain before collapsing dead in Epona's bog. Another Forte soldier fired two arrows at Vecni, but missed with both as she easily turned and twisted her body to avoid them. Dim green light swirled around the other Forte soldiers, searing some of them with divine radiant magic. The soldiers struggled to swim in the pond, slowly drowning. The eight gray-skinned creatures from earlier finally made their move and came up behind the adventurers, pincering them between the Forte soldiers and themselves. One of the beasts opened its mouth, exposing sharp teeth, and bit down hard on Soren's upper back. The creature then slashed Soren twice on the back, leaving shallow, mostly superficial wounds. Soren's magic mixed with bog gas and formed a twisting green mist. The gas encircled the two living crocodiles in the pond and peeled apart the reptilian scales, melting away the beast's skin and disintegrating their organs. The husks of the deceased crocodiles sunk into the murky pond and disappeared. Malakos readied his ice knife spell, planning to hurl his cold magic into a cluster of gray-skinned beasts once one of them walked past him. Vecni drew out her whip and lashed out at the heavily armored man twice, striking him with both attacks. She infused key into both strikes, attempting to stunning strike him, but he resisted her both times. Soren used his telekinesis to push the man with the heavy red halberd backwards, but the soldier pushed with all his might against Soren's psychic powers and resisted being shoved. Soren turned and launched a fireball at the gray-skinned creatures behind him. Malakos did a combat roll through the brush, utilizing uncanny dodge to escape the flames, but still took some fire damage. All eight of the gray-skinned creatures were torched and burned alive by Soren's fire magic. All that remained of the beasts was their smoking skeletal frames. The man with the heavy red halberd slashed Vecni twice with his great axe. The blows were glancing, and Vecni suffered minimal damage from the man's huge weapon. Beric casted Thunderous Smite, charging his great axe with thunder magic. He swung at the man in heavy red armor with all his might, slashing him down his chest. The Thunderous Might was released, and the magic reverberated throughout the bog, disturbing many of the animals living there. The man planted his feet and resisted being pushed back by the smite, but Soren casted silvery barbs, forcing the soldier to fall 10 feet backwards, splashing into the pond and re-entering the area of effect for Soren's sickening radiance. Beric advanced on his downed foe and raised his axe up high into the air. 
Barrack's axe blade stuck deep into the fallen man's chest, channeling radiant divine power and delivering an extra effect of divine smite. The green radiant gas swirled through the battlefield, burning and peeling the skin off the remaining nine Forte soldiers. The men raised their hands and stared in horror as their skin fell from their extremities and their fingers fell off. The men let off painful, horrific screams as they collapsed, melting before each of them expired. The man with the heavy red hauberk looked up from laying on his back to see Vecni bring her whip down upon his exposed throat. The barbs of her whip sunk into his jugular and tore his neck apart as she pulled back on her whip, spraying blood all over Barrack and into the pond, causing the wounded man to quickly bleed out. <laughs> Malakos searched the corpses of the dead Forte soldiers looking for arrows and he found 30. Vecni and Malico searched the heavily armored man, finding a great axe, the red hauberk with a forte sigil in the chest, and a spell book. Malikos gave the hauberk to Beric, who donned his fallen foe's armor. Soren approached the two lizard folk prisoners locked in a cage. He recognized one of the lizard men, a smaller lizard folk, wearing a brown cloak, as Gendi. Soren and Vecni met Gendi in Lorgan's tavern some time ago. The other lizard folk was wearing yellow armor and appeared to be a female. The female lizard folk addressed Soren with a murder and began speaking to him in a strange dialect of draconic. It quickly became apparent she could not speak any common at all. Malikos, who was standing nearby, spoke proper draconic and could understand the female's words. Malikos and the female lizard folk spoke for a bit. The female looked like a warrior, wearing yellow chain mail and armed with a spear, but Malikos found her attractive, considering her a 7 out of 10. She thanked the human for rescuing she and Gendi. The female, Urza, explained she and her allies were at war with Forte, and her group lost a battle nearby, where she and Gendi were captured. Malikos remarked, that while only Urza and Gendi survived, at least her compatriots were avenged by his party. She asked where the rest of the lizard folk were. Urza advised Malikos her people lived on Comet Mountain, to the north. She spoke of the leader of Frank, Snorian, stating he was a great warrior and leader, adding he should rule the kingdom of Dova. Malikos picked the lock to the cage containing Urza and Gendi, freeing them. In a raspy, sinister voice, spoken in common, Gendi asked Vecni, Malikos, and Soren if they completed the mission he gave them. He had asked one of them use the dagger with Blackwing's sigil to murder a Forte soldier and leave the weapon stuck in the soldier's corpse to frame Blackwing and Chaos. Soren answered they did so, prior to leaving Vigor Valley City. Gendi thanked Soren for the good service he provided. Malikos asked Gendi if he and Urza would like to travel with their party to Ifrai, and he agreed. Gendi thanked Malikos for saving he and his companions from the foolish human softskins showing great disdain and disgust for the human race. Yes, humans are disgusting, Malikos quipped. Gendi beckoned the party to follow him to a fry, where Snorian would reward them. Malikos and the others agreed. Malikos became suspicious of the deceased man of Forte that, while living, wore Barrack's new armor. He investigated the dead man and the armor, determining the Hulberk was adorned with abyssal glyphs that granted the user certain powers, but made him vulnerable to radiant magic. While Beric fretted over whether or not to remove his new armor, Vecni took a swig from her water skin filled with bourbon. She passed the skin over to Malikos, amused at Beric's predicament. Soren ritual casted identify on Beric's red hauberk and learned it was cursed. 
trying to remove the armor would cause damage to the wearer. Attuning to the hauberk would grant the user a plus one to strength and a minus one to intelligence. Soren casted Dispel Magic on the Hallberg, ending the item's curse and magical properties. <laughs> Beric drew out his pale pink axe and scraped off the Forte Sigil on the chest of his new armor. Then he cut the flowing red cape off the back of the armor so he didn't accidentally trip on it during battle. Gendi and Urza led the adventurers north through the bog where they exited out of the tree line. The group entered a warm area. They observed north was a path through hills, then eventually mountains in the distance. This region looked like it became quite steep, constantly elevating as one progressed north. The adventurers surmised that they would be required to scale a mountain to follow the path all the way to the summit, where the lizardfolk village of Afry, the stronghold of the faction called Frank, was supposedly located. Urza and Gendi began to follow the path north. Before the adventurers followed after them, Vecni, Soren, Beric, and Malakos heard something coming from the west. The sound was an intense rumbling noise, followed by an audible explosion. A flash of light seared into the sky from the west, blinding the adventurers for a moment. The rumbling continued for a few seconds more, then ceased. Beric immediately realized the sound and bright light came from the direction of the Kingdom of Ironbridge and his village, Stoneview. Beric found an explosion coming from the direction of his home to be very queer and quite concerning. The Kingdom of Ironbridge was quite far from Epona's bog, and the adventurers could not see anything of note in the distance when looking west. Soren did not seem concerned with the fate of Beric's home. Vecni took another swig of bourbon from her water skin and offered it to her dwarven companion. Beric took a hearty drink from the skin. Malakos asked Urza in Draconic if explosions like that were commonplace. Urza answered it wasn't, but she did not care about Stoneview or Ironbridge and wanted to continue on to Comet Mountain. Malakos asked Beric if he had any family in the direction of the sound, adding he believed the sound may have been an intense explosion with enough power to level a city. Beric gruffly answered, the family I protect is there. I've been through genocide before. It sucks, but you'll get over it, Vecni remarked. Beric advised the group they should go west to check on his village. Malakos agreed with Beric and spoke on his behalf to convince Soren and Vecni of the same. Vecni did not care about Stoneview and the Ironbridge Kingdom. Instead, she wanted to travel to Afry to obtain a key needed to bypass Prycutter Keep so she could pursue the misfit bastards to Cutthroat's docks and rescue Prince. After a bit more discussion, Vecni and Soren decided they would continue north to Afry. Vecni pulled out Qual's feather token and tossed it into the air. Her item summoned a rock-like bird capable of carrying her entire party while moving at half speed. Malakos and Soren affectionately called this creature the Slay Queen Pride Bird, as it was multicolored and majestic. Gendi, Urza, Vecni, Soren, Malakos, and Beric boarded the Slay Queen Pride Bird and flew north. Beric craned his neck west, hoping to catch a glimpse of his village and its current state, but he was unable to see such a great distance away. Further north, the adventurers made some observations about the mountains up ahead. They saw multiple paths, animals, birds, and bustling wildlife. Further still, the adventurers observed a small village comprised of tents on the summit of the largest mountain. Whilst riding the Slay Queen Pride Bird, Vecni began reading her manual of quickness of action, while Beric fretted over how to convince the rest of his group to detour to Stoneview. Beric once again made a case for the group to turn west towards Stoneview. He explained he had been protecting the Dragonbane family for a long time, and with Trogdor's recent passing, his strength was needed in Stoneview now more than ever. Malko spoke on Beric's behalf again, persuasively convincing Vecni and Soren to help Beric. Vecni ordered her rainbow bird to turn west in the direction of the Ironbridge Kingdom. The adventurers rode atop the Slay Queen Pride Bird for miles to investigate the origin of the explosion in bright light. Before long, they could see a village in the distance, which Beric recognized as his home, Stoneview. Stoneview was a modest mining village filled with small homes and hovels populated by dwarves. The families in Stoneview once resided in Ironbridge Castle, but after many years of wars and fighting with surrounding threats, the Dragonbane family and others fled and established Stoneview. Beric had long served as the protector of the Dragonbane family line. Beric observed Stoneview appeared unharmed, surmising the loud explosion must have come from somewhere else, likely Ironbridge Castle. 
far in the distance much further west. Beric observed white smoke rising into the sky where Ironbridge Castle was located. Malico surveyed the rising white smoke and remarked, They are probably roasting a giant pig or a dragon. Vecni asked Beric how the pubs, bars, and saloons were in Ironbridge. Beric answered Stoneview had a superior bar called the Firebrew Inn, which was often frequented by a talented gnomish bard. Vecni suspected this gnomish bard was honesty, which Beric confirmed. Beric added King Groudlum Ironbridge and his queen, Tanaday, would reward the group richly if they did good service upon arriving in the kingdom.